going to give a, just a little brief overview of, of bats and bat biology and part of why we think they're so cool to start with, and then we're going to show you some of the stuff that we've been doing. So the first thing to know about bats is that there's a lot of them. There's over 1,300 living species, including some like this that are dressed up for Halloween already, right? <laughs> Orange and black. Um, this is a woolly painted bat from Asia. I never knew that there was a bat that looked like this until I'd already been working on bats for about five years. And there's a lot of different sizes of bats. So bats include the smallest living mammal, which is this bumblebee bat, and its whole body is about the size of the end of your little finger, just the last joint. And the, the whole bat, when it has its wings outstretched, is only about two inches across. So it's about the size of a moth. In contrast, there's some really big bats. <laughs> so this is a flying fox from Southeast Asia, and when it has its wings out, it's almost six feet across. Two of the things that make bats particularly special is first of all that they have wings. They're the only mammals that are adapted for powered flight, which means like birds, they can stay aloft by flapping their wings. And they also use echolocation. Not all bats have echolocation, but the majority do, and it's a form of biological sonar that they use for detecting obstacles in their way. So as they fly, they can tell in three dimensions what's around them. But they also use it for detecting prey and tracking it in three dimensions and chasing it down and catching it. Not all bats do that, though. Some bats listen for the sounds of insects hitting leaves, and then they fly down and they pick them up. So this bat has a katydid that it's plucked off a leaf. So a lot of the bats that do this sort of gleaning behavior have big external ears that they use for listening for their prey. There's other bats that eat small mammals, things like mice, frogs, other bats even. However, not all bats eat animals. Some bats are specialized for fruit eating. This is an um, old world fruit bat that only eats fruit. And it also is one of the members of one group that doesn't echolocate. So you can see they have big eyes. These bats can see very well and they use sight and they use smell to detect their food, to find ripe fruit and things like that. Other bats take their food from flowers. So they find flowers and they have long noses and extensible tongues that they can dip down to get the nectar and pollen out of the corolla of the flower. Now these bats that feed on nectar and pollen and on fruit are really important in ecosystems for seed dispersal and pollination for plants, just as the insect eating bats are really important for controlling insect populations. And finally, vampire bats. There really are vampire bats. So we have all these different kinds of things that bats do, and these different features of their, their ecologies are reflected in their anatomy. All right, so my favorite thing about bats is looking at them really close up. So there's a lot of variation in the shape of their faces, and then also the skulls, which are shown beneath the bat faces above. What's cool is that these differences in skull shape relate to how the bats are using their skulls. And the biggest differences among bats are actually in the snout length, which relates to their diet. So this bat on the right with a short snout is adapted for feeding on hard fruit. So it's, short, it's very short snout allows it to produce really high bite forces. The one on the left feeds on nectar. So like Nancy was saying, it has a long snout that allows it to stick its face down into tube-shaped flowers and lap up the nectar. And the one in between is an omnivore. So it's not particularly well adapted for any one type of feeding behavior, but it can feed on a variety of things. So this is a really nice story, long noses for flowers, short noses for fruit, but there's actually just a huge amount of variation here. Also, their echolocation behavior is reflected in their skull form. So some of those at the bottom that seem like they have their snouts upraised, those animals use different forms of echolocation than some of the ones with the longer, flatter skulls. So there's all these different sensory modalities sort of all wound up in the skull, and a lot of other stuff as well, as Abby's going to talk about now. So uh, when I first came to AMNH, I was coming in from a PhD studying carnivore skulls, so animals like bears and lions where their skulls are really big. And so I really wanted to get some hands-on experience with the bat skulls before I really started delving into their internal anatomy. And then I realized that most of them fit on the tip of my finger. So I'd be squinting, <laughs> trying to see them in the collection, and I even put them under microscopes. And it's still really, really difficult to try to study a bat skull and really 
understand what you're looking at. Uh, the other thing that I also like to do is draw them, and I was noticing that it looked like there was a lot of differences in the inflated structures on the front of their snouts, and nobody's really studied those, so we really needed a way to figure out how to get inside of bat skulls. So when I first started working on bats here, which I have to admit is now over 25 years ago, what we worked with were the specimens in the collections in their raw form. So if I wanted to look at fur patterns, I would go and pull out a drawer, like these are flying fox skins that were collected about 100 years ago in Africa and Southeast Asia, or I would get a skull out and hold it in my hand and draw it like, like Abby was talking about. We also have, as in this tray down here on the lower left, we have specimens of whole bats preserved in alcohol. These come back from expeditions and they allow us to look at the features of the face and things like that. But if I wanted to see what was inside a skull, the only way to get in there would be to break it open. And if it was a rare animal that was only in a jar, well, then basically you're out of luck. So we have these resources in the museum, collections that go back well over 100 years. There's actually almost 60,000 bat specimens in our collections. And most of these came from the large overseas expeditions in the past. We're still doing collecting today, but mostly today we collect tissue samples. We don't collect large numbers of animals as we did in the past. But we have things like bats in jars. Well, what can we do with this if you want to study the skeleton? Well, today we have things we can do. <laughs> this is based on a CAT scan of that specimen I just showed you in the jar. And what's really great about the American Museum of Natural History is we have our own CT scanner, or actually as I call it, the bat photocopier. And so this is our machine. If we look inside this little window that you see on the front of the machine, you can see my bat inside, and it's, it's, it's not a very glorious <laughs> setup for the bat, at least. Um, but the yellow thing, both of those yellow things emit x-rays. And the way this works, it's similar to what you would have happen at a doctor's office if you got hurt and they needed to check and see if something is broken. The x-rays come out of that tube, and because the bat is denser than air, some of the x-rays don't actually make it through, and so that results in a white pattern in the area where the skeleton was sitting in the CT scan or the bat. And this actually rotates in 360 degrees so that you get a picture from all around the bat. And we use very, very high-tech equipment to prepare the specimens. My favorite is the beta fish feeding tube and grandpa's pill bottles. My saran-wrapped skulls, they get carefully wrapped and placed into probably grandpa's pill bottle. And alcohol specimens, which still have all the skin and fur, get put into some other kind of plastic receptacle. And so what I think is really cool about working on these bats and working somewhere like AMNH, where we have these, all this history of collecting, is specimens like this crumpled up little bat. If you can see up on the tag, it actually says Roosevelt Expedition Brazil. So this bat was collected when Theodore Roosevelt in 1913-1914 was mapping the Amazon River Basin. So one of the people on his team actually collected that. So it's like major nerd moment, you know, <laughs> doing this Teddy Roosevelt bat. And, um, and so it's, it's really fun for many reasons. And um, when we get the end result at, after the bat has been scanned, we get a series of slices throughout the skull. So those 360 degree spins that each specimen takes results in a stack of images. And each image corresponds to a specific location throughout the skull. And so it'd be like taking a slice out of a piece of, or out of a bread loaf, for example. That's sort of how it works. So we use this technology to look inside the bats to investigate aspects of their anatomy that we can't easily see in a more up-close fashion. And we're going to show you some really fancy movies in a little bit. <laughs> um, this is a common vampire bat. This was a picture taken by my colleague Brock Fenton when we were working in Belize a few years ago, um, catching vampire bats coming out of a looter's trench into a Mayan temple. So it's really <laughs> cool stuff. But he got some really great pictures. I've been interested for a long time in the teeth of vampire bats and comparing different species. And I had a student who was working for a summer project comparing some fossil vampires with living vampires. But we needed to see more about the teeth than we could easily see from a standard museum specimen, which is just the skull. 
So what we're actually looking at is we're flying through the slices that I just showed you, and because they're in black and white, we can tell a special computer software that anything above a certain brightness is bone and anything below that is air, and then it makes this digital replica of the original specimen. So it, it does not, it, it is commanded to do all of this by Abby, who <laughs> spent a lot of time learning how to take these slices and make these really cool movies. But when you have a, a skull like this, you can put it together from the slices, but you can also take it apart and look at details. And we're going to show you a lot of that this evening. So this is the front end of a vampire bat skull. You can see those projecting teeth sticking out here on the right. And with a close up, we can do something called segmentation, where we can basically cut away the parts of the, the skull or, what, or the skeleton that we're not interested in to focus on the parts that we are interested in. So in this case, these are the teeth of a vampire bat pulled out of the skull. So I can look at the roots, I can look at the relative proportion. You can see there's two big slicing teeth in front that it uses for making little um, nicks in the skin of whatever animal it's going to feed on, and then it licks at the wound with its tongue. There's two little teeth behind there, though, which are non-functional now, and those are interesting for constructing the relationships between living vampires and some of the fossil forms. And so. The newest thing now with CT scanning, in terms of trying to understand how animals are able to you know, feed on different types of things, is to actually use this technique called iodine staining. And so this is a brown flower bat, and it's really been gorging itself on flowers. And so if we want to understand, right, there, there, there's a skull, but there's also muscles and other tissue that are surrounding the skull that are involved in feeding. And so if we want to understand how those muscles are organized around the skull, we can do this new staining technique. So this is viewing it sideways, so the nose is facing this way and the brain is in the back. This area in the back here is the brain. That part there is the cerebellum, which is involved in motion, so um, coordination so, while you're moving. And in the middle, you can almost see the gray matter and the white matter, so there's differentiation in the tissues. And then up here is the part of the brain that deals with picking up uh, the sense of smell. And you can even see the tongue and the individual strands of muscle inside of it. So we're able to get a lot of detail, and this is all, again, non-destructive, and you can take the stains back out of this specimen so then it's good as new uh, to uh, Yeah, we're, we're finding that again. we can do this with old museum specimens, too. So again, uh, a bat that's been in a jar for 70 years, we can pull it out and soak it in iodine and put it in our CAT scanner and get this these wonderful data that would never have been imagined by the people who originally collected the animal 70 or 100 years ago. And so to sort of put this together to make it make a little more sense, this is a bat skull with the muscles that have been segmented out of one of these iodine scans. And what these are showing is the pinkish muscle, the teal muscle, and the yellow muscle are involved in closing the jaw. So when this bat is biting, it's using those muscles. When it opens the jaw to bite, it's using that darker purple muscle called the uh, digastric. And so you can even model the different partitions within an individual muscle, like the lighter pink, versus the darker pink in the muscle that's sort of on the temporal region in this guy. So if we look at animals that have different kinds of diets and do the same thing, and um, you start to see that they have different muscle proportions compared to one another that are also related to diet. So this is a lot of really cool work that's coming out of University of Washington in the Santana lab. And um, you have the bat in the upper left, a uh, weasel in the right, a shrew in the bottom left and some kind of rodent in the bottom right. I don't know what the Correct. science names of rodents. Yes, the vol. <laughs> and now, what my research gets into is I'm interested in the fact that skulls have multiple functions. So we've talked about feeding, and this little guy is munching on some banana that he's smeared all over his face. But what you'll also notice is the ear moves, so it's hearing, it's sniffing, it's also seeing, but kind of looks like it's in a food coma <laughs> at this point. But um, there's a lot going on inside the skull, and in addition to sniffing, it's breathing regularly. So I'm really interested in how these things fit together in addition to feeding. And if you guys remember that tiny little skull that was on my fingertip, 
it's now the size of like three of me, <laughs> and I can actually see what's going on. So if I want to understand what those bulges are on the front of the skull and how that relates to things like breathing or sniffing or you know, even just how it modifies the outside of the skull, I can do that with these 3D models. So like Nancy showed with the teeth and the vampire bat, I can go in and fill in structures that I'm interested in. So what we're seeing here as the skull turns, we're now looking at the top of the skull. The green is the nasal chamber, so where air flows in and out for breathing and smelling. And then the red, purple, and blue are structures called sinuses. Like, you know, we all have them, they get infected, right? <laughs> and in these guys, uh, there are a lot of them. So over 60% of its nasal chamber is just air space that doesn't function for breathing. And so we're trying to understand what these structures are actually for. And so we're actually going to, in the next slide, look at skulls facing downwards with the nose facing down. And in the upper left is the bat from the previous slide. And these are all close relatives of that sac-winged bat. And they all have different skull shapes. And if I want to look at what's underneath, I can do that again. And what you see is that there's a lot of variation in these sinus cavities. And there's a lot of variation in the shape of the nasal chamber where air is flowing in and out. And so I'm really interested in figuring out how that contributes to the evolution of all of these different skull shapes. And it turns out that there are a lot of similarities among species that are closely related. So you would, in general, expect things that are closely related to look similar. And we are finding that this is somewhat the case with the sinuses. And making a lot of discoveries inside of the nose that actually haven't been described so, before. So why do you think there's all this variation in sinus form across a bunch of closely related animals? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I know in my previous work, which was on carnivores, the sinuses take up space that's not actually used for mechanical purposes. And in bats, that might be particularly important to them because they're flying. So these might act as weight reduction structures, but also maybe they play a role in echolocation because a lot of these animals are making very specific calls and some of the bulges on the outside of the skull are linked with the calls that they're making. So one of the really interesting things about the bats of this particular group is they have really different social behaviors. Some of them keep harems um, and some of them uh, have different um, systems of organizing males and females and mating and so on and they use, we know that they use odor is really important for them in terms of communicating with one another so one of the things we're thinking about doing is trying to correlate these differences we're seeing in skull morphology with the different ecologies of the different species to try and understand the evolution of their different social structures and ecologies and perhaps make predictions for species where nobody's ever been able to observe them based on what we're seeing in their anatomy. And these are really cool too because it seems like a lot of these sinus structures are being used to modify the internal shape of the nasal chamber, which can affect the way that air flows through the nasal chamber, which might which we're be impacting. See in just a minute. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. <laughs> Um, this is not yeah. a bat now. <laughs> this is my throwback to carnivores. So this is a coyote skull that sits on my desk. And when you look up its nose, it's got these really cool tree-like structures inside that almost look like oh, scrolls of yes. paper. And those are called turbinals. And if we were to chop the skull straight down the middle and look at it sideways, it would look something like this. And so there are two sets of turbinals inside of the nose, and the front region is obviously located in the front, and then there's also a uh, back region. And the region in the front functions during respiration because when you're breathing in air, right now in the room, the air is cooler and drier than the air inside of our lungs and also you know, cooler than our body temperature. So in order to breathe in, it'd be much more comfortable if the, w the air were warm and more humid. And so the turbinals act to warm and moisten the air as it's breathed in you all have turbinals, by the way. Yeah, we, they we may have... not be as big as the coyote, but you have them. <laughs> yeah, ours are kind of sad, but... Um, but they're, <laughs> but they, they're there. But they're there. Um, and when you breathe out again, the water is reclaimed from that air and also cooled down again by the time you breathe out. So an animal like a dog which, or a coyote, which has a lot of turbinal surface area, can reclaim, I think, I want to say, like, 
you know, sort of modestly about 70%, but I think it might actually be 90% of the total heat and water that they have inside of their body. It's maintained by this turbinal system of uh, conditioning the air. And now in the back of the nose, you notice when the bat was sniffing. You can tell when an animal's sniffing, right? It, it stops looking normal and then starts, you know, they, they do, they can, do can this weird. Do that again? I do that. That's how I sniff. When I go, when I go <laughs> sniff a flower, that's what happens. Just, so when an animal is sniffing, what's really cool is it changes the way the air flows through the nose. And so it actually increases the velocity of the air and it shoots it to the back turbinals. And the back turbinals hold epithelia that have nervous tissue that picks up odorant molecules from the air. I can translate that into English for yeah, you. Sorry. <laughs> I get really nerdy with the noses. <laughs> the tissue inside the back of the nasal cavity is where the nerves are that you use for smell. There, thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Sometimes I get carried away with the, the nerd lingo. And so this area, it, it, it's uh, sort of portioned off from the rest of the nose by a plate of bone. So that also helps keep the air swirling around in the back of the nose so that scent particles are more likely to be picked up and sensed by an animal. And so looking in bat noses, sometimes you see weird stuff. And sometimes you can't really see it too well because bats are so tiny. So I was looking in the noses of this family called rhinolophidae, which are the horseshoe bats, and have these really awesome nasal structures. Uh, you can see on the front of the nose of this intermediate horseshoe bat, it's just, it's just wild looking. These are called nose leaves, and they seem to be involved in echolocation, so that's the way it's supposed to look. <laughs> and um, they're species specific, so different species of horseshoe bats have slightly different complexities and little flaps and so on to their nose leaves, and that's one of the ways you identify them in the field when you catch one is you look at that interesting structure on its nose and you can tell what species it is. And so inside their noses, to me, it looked like they had strands of bone that almost looked like swirly spaghetti sticking down the back of their throat. And so again, we turned to CT scans to try to observe what these structures actually are. And so this is the same uh, bat skull and if we look in, it does indeed look like there are some weird structures in there. And it turns out that these spaghetti-like structures actually stick out behind the hard palate down the, uh, the uh, throat, basically. And so these animals have this freestanding strand of bone. I just, it makes me sneeze looking at it. And it's cool, we can cut away the skull and look at this from all different angles to really get a sense of the three-dimensional structure of these turbinals and see that like, these are really strange. Like, this is not a normal uh, condition to uh, observe turbinals. This is not the normal shape that turbinals usually take. We can also look at them in the context of the nasal chamber and sinuses as well. So it's a really amazing that we can use the CT technology to observe. And as, as you can things. see, this is really three-dimensional, so it's, mm -hmm. it's something that's really hard to see unless you can turn things around, right? And so being able to turn things around in the computer lets you get the relationships between the different bits of bone and the spaces and the tissue. It's just an amazing way of just being able to see and describe something that otherwise we just couldn't get to. Mm -hmm. And then what's really neat is that if we look at a bunch of different types of horseshoe bats, these weird strands of bone are different in different species. So they have the same general pattern of being sort of long and swirly looking, but the length at which they stick behind the hard palate varies. So these three pictures in the bottom are taken from the roof of the mouth. So we're looking at the bottom side of a horseshoe bat skull where that in each square case. Is. Yeah, where the the red square is. And you can see the one on the left has really long turbinals. This one in the middle has sort of intermediate shaped ones. And the one on the uh, right has really short ones. So there's a lot of variation and we're still kind of trying to figure out the anatomy of these and, and then we eventually. have no idea what yeah. any of this means. Yeah. <laughs> so we can also, besides using this technology to look at what we would think of as the normal morphology of bats, we can also look at unusual cases that we find. And this is, this is a one which really caught me by surprise. So in my field work in Belize, we catch um, these pygmy fruit-eating bats every year. They're really cute. They're little <laughs> fruit-eating bats. This is another picture by my colleague Brock Fenton from Belize. And we were working a few years ago um, with some researchers who were working on reproductive biology of these animals. 
And in the course of our research, we found something really, really unusual. And that is this little specimen, which is a single fetus of a bat, but it has two heads. <laughs> no one had ever seen anything like this before. And in the past, it, the, you can see the size of it, it's two centimeters long. In the past, we couldn't have really done much with this specimen, but by CAT scanning it, we're able to see all of the details of what's going on inside. And the people working on this are involved in looking at development of mammals and also developmental mistakes that happen in mammals. You can learn a lot by looking, unfortunately, at the anomalies. Here's a picture of um, where we've segmented out the two skulls. So there's the purple head and the green head, basically. So this animal was not going to live in nature, um, but it gave, gives us a chance to look at a really unusual situation with CT scanning. And if we look down on the top, we can actually see what bones are fused together here. So the M shown in yellow is the maxilla, which is part of the face. And so this animal had two brain cases, but fused together in the middle. It's another little piece of information about how bats develop and how mistakes can happen in building these complex skulls. To wrap things up, uh, I thought I'd tell a really fun little story about this acuminate horseshoe bat. Given that AMNH has been around for a really long time, we have some really old specimens. And these bats were collected in Indonesia in 1891. X-rays weren't even discovered until 1895. So one of the things that we're really trying to drive home with uh, talking about CT technology is just how much it's revolutionized what we're able to get out of museum specimens. And I got really excited. I found the person who collected this bat. <laughs> He's great. His, he was an Italian naturalist and anthropologist. His name was Elio Medigliani. And he did a lot of important work in Indonesia and I believe also Malaysia uh, going on collecting trips. So he was a very interesting person. And so I got to scan his bat and the whole time, like, what would he think of this? You know, he has no concept. Nobody has any concept of x-rays or anything like that. So um, I guess this video is for him showing all the cool anatomy that we can see inside of this bat skull from 1891. So it's one of our horseshoe bats. It's got the really weird turbinals that we were able to discover by looking at CT scans. So that's a front view. These ones don't stick out as far as the first one we've seen. And if we want to look inside of the ear, for example, so ears are really important to bats because that's how they perceive the echolocation calls when they're trying to locate prey, we can get rid of the skull and look at the inner ear. So what we're looking at are the three inner middle ear bones. So you can see coming in the stirrup, which is the stapes, it actually looks like a stirrup the incus, which is in yellow, and the malleus, they vibrate against the cochlea, which looks like a cinnamon bun and allows you to perceive different pitches. And then these weird arch-like things, which help the bat determine how its head is moving in three-dimensional space. So we can go in and zoom in on all these really neat structures that are hidden inside of the bones of the skull. So in essence, being able to use these kinds of technology, it's, it's almost like suddenly being able to take books out of a library and use them in a completely new way to understand things that weren't even dreamt of of the time when the book was made. So we think of our museum specimens in essence like this. These are um, amazing resources and now every year that passes with new technology, with, with the DNA technology and everything that has moved ahead with visualization like this, we're getting more and more and more information out of material that was collected a long time ago. And so a lot of the cutting edge work that's going on throughout the museum and all sorts of work on different organisms is using material that's been here for a long time to answer new questions that, in ways that we never thought we could and nobody ever dreamt of you know, even a decade ago, let alone 100 years ago. Yeah, I think it'll be cool to see what they do with specimens that are collected now. Well, yeah, one of, the, one of the questions years. we always ask ourselves when we're looking at stuff like this is what are people going to be doing 10 years from now, 100 years from now with this material? I mean, there's going to be, one can imagine, continued changes in what we can do. So it's a really exciting time to be working on organisms. Um, but, you know, who knows where we're going to be in the future, though. It's, it's pretty exciting for those of us who, who are getting to do this sort of stuff. So. Who knows?
Okay, so I think we're done with our presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>